Hello, I'm Ian McGilchrist. Um, I suppose I describe myself as a, a writer. I'm a doctor. I've worked as a psychiatrist. I started off in the humanities as a student of literature and philosophy. And uh, now I, I tend to give a lot of uh, talks over the internet. <laughs> <laughs> Marvellous. Um, so, welcome, Ian. Uh, it's such an honour to, to be able to chat with you today. And... Um, I, I, I think out of everyone that we've interviewed, um, you're the person who, whenever I've told my friends, they've gone, oh my word, can you please ask him this? Uh, so congratulations. <laughs> you're, oh, you're, uh, it really is a, a huge honour to have you on, on with us today and, and, and congratulations oh, in advance of everything that you've done. Um, okay, well, uh, you. I, um, I just thought that maybe... I'd start. I mean, you're, you're at the moment. You're this in, in, incredible, uh, incredible author, incredible thinker. But um, you know, have you always been this way? How did you get here? <laughs> what was your journey uh, to to get to well, where you are? I wondered. I suppose I've always been a sort of horribly um, curious child and interested in a lot of things. Um, and yes, I mean, from my early teens, certain philosophical. Uh, positions particularly attracted me and interested me and there were a number of things I believed that most people didn't seem to think were right um, one of them is that the whole is definitely not the same as the sum of the parts um, that trajectories in nature are never linear but actually usually spiral shaped or circular um, that the world out there particularly the animate world is not uh, inert but is actually actively uh, in an encounter with us and our reality comes out of that encounter. So I thought these things already when I was a teenager. Um, I went up to Oxford with the idea of doing philosophy and theology but in my interview they said philosophy and theology is not even an honours degree, you can't do that, you, you, you know you must do something proper. <laughs> and it, I had to take the entrance exam in the school subject which just happened to be in lit and uh, my, my tutor said, oh, you're rather good at this. Why don't you come and do this? So I did. And then as soon as I got my degree, I got a fellowship at All Souls College, Oxford, which is an extraordinary thing that, that gives a young person after a three-day exam, if you win the prize, you get seven years in which you don't actually get pressure put on you. You don't have to teach. You don't have to publish. You only have to use the time to read and find out about things. So at the wow. time, it was a colossal um, privilege, of course, and I didn't completely realise, it was only in hindsight that I realised what a, what a gift that was. And for a long time, I thought I'd wasted it. But actually what happened was <laughs> I, I got interested in the mind-body problem for reasons I, I could go into. It was really my dissatisfactions with how we work, approach works of art, we turn them into general abstract ideas. Uh, instead, they are unique embodied beings that we encounter. And we make the implicit explicit and therefore destroy their power. So I got interested in the mind-body problem. And that led me to um, many seminar rooms with philosophers. But I thought the philosophers were just all too um, disembodied in their approach to this question. I wanted to do it in a more embodied way. And the answer to that was, go off and be a doctor and specialise in the overlap between the brain and the mind, neurology and psychiatry. Wow. So that's, what I, that's what I did, um, cutting a very long story short. And, and yeah. then I, I started, started getting interested in the difference between the hemispheres, a, a, a toxic topic that I was advised not to touch with a barge pole because it was all <laughs> pop science and had been exploded long ago. But I thought actually, no, the more I learned about it, the more I realised that it was something incredibly important there of a philosophical kind. So we may come on to talking about what those, um, what, what I mean by that. 100%. I mean, I, I just want to go back to a couple of things you said there. One I thought was very interesting that you know, you got, got given seven years just to read. And it's interesting, mm. whenever you talk to people who, who are doing remarkable things like yourself, there often seems a really long period of reflection where you're given time to read and to think. And I don't yes. think you get that very much in the modern day workplace. Um, you I, don't. I, I, and I mean, go, go for it. Oh, no, no, I, what, I, no, I what, what, an no, answer. I, <laughs> no, what I was going to say is that I'm not even sure that, I don't know that I'm right about this, but I suspect that even the peace that I had then 
may not exist now because the temptation always is to to fuss, to manage, to monitor. How's he doing? Is he really on course? Um, has he published anything yet? No, five years have gone by. And, and actually, if I had been forced to write three papers a year, I'd have crystallised my thinking very early and it would have become very narrow. But because people trusted, I mean, after you're elected, they sort of think, well, this is an interesting person, we'll just let them get on with it. And I think we would have much more of that in life in general. Stop breathing down the necks of creative people. And it's quite true that sometimes they won't uh, produce very much. But if you breathe down people's necks, nobody will produce anything interesting, imaginative and creative. You have to trust. And occasionally you build into your thing, it won't work. But a lot of the time you'll get fabulous results. And so I'm immensely grateful to it. And it, it allowed me to spread my interests through science, philosophy, different languages, cultures, histories and so on. And that eventuated in my two best-known books, The Master and His Emissary, The Divided Brain and The Making of the Western World, and my more recent uh, book, uh, The Matter with Things, uh, Our Brains, Our Delusions and the Unmaking of the World. <laughs> this this lovely book here, well, that's that's part part one of your lovely book is behind me. <laughs> part um, one. A yes. Amazon only sent me part one. Um, they're sending me part two today, apparently. Uh, <laughs> Gosh, they that's forgot. terrible. <laughs> oh, gosh. Uh, so, so it's all good. I'll, uh, I'll, it's going to take me a while to finish the part one. So I think we, <laughs> I was going to take it to, uh, to Greece with me, to Rhodes. I thought that was uh, uh, a good oh. place to read a philosophy book, uh, maybe. <laughs> uh, well, I think it but, is. Um, I think it is. <laughs> but don't let it ruin your holiday. But <laughs> no, I think there's a message here which is about pace and the, the quality of attention that comes with slowing down and not being distracted. And I guess this book was a very long time in gestating, a very long time in writing, and takes a long time to read. But my readers tell me that this process has rewarded them. So <laughs> I've, I've heard nothing are. but marvellous things. So bravo. Oh, no, great. So your, your first book, you're saying you, you, you took almost 30 years to get to writing your first book. And I think the second one you said was around 10, 15 years or so. Well, the... it, it, that's right. But it's not quite true because my first book I wrote <laughs> in my 20s, it was called Against right. Criticism and it explained why right. I thought there was something wrong with the philosophical process of, of criticizing work of art that was published by Faber and then there was a very long pause while I um, worked incredibly hard as a junior hospital doctor um, with small children in the family and then ended up with these other uh, books after I'd been to the Maudsley and become a, a, a psychiatrist and neurosurgeon. Yeah. Marvellous and then the, 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 you were saying that your, your sort of specialism is in, is in the two sort of different the, the brain is not one being, it's sort of split in two. There's a left and a, and a right brain. Um, and I, I know you said earlier that it was contentious. I, I remember actually in, in one of our courses with Rory Sutherland, he talks about the left brain and the right brain. Someone emailed me once and said, I want a refund. Uh, there's no, that, that, that's been debunked ages ago. It's, uh, there is no left and right yes. brain. So, yes. um, <laughs> um, yes. what, well, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, love to go into that. <laughs> Yes. Well, the first hurdle I have to get over is this uh, idea that it's all been debunked. I think by now I've pretty thoroughly debunked the idea that it's been debunked. <laughs> it's just that our earlier idea about it was wrong. So anyone who tells them debunked, tell them they need a bloody good debunking themselves and go and study <laughs> McGilchrist. <laughs> because without being funny about it, um, I, I must be one of a handful of people in the world who has so thoroughly researched hemisphere differences over decades. Um, I'm not saying I'm the only one, of course, but I, I have a particular take on it and I have really put years of work into it. And it, what, what, what struck me was that in the past people had thought of the brain as a machine. Uh, and so in the 70s and 80s they said, what does each part of the brain do? Oh, the left hemisphere does reason and language and the right hemisphere does imagination and painting pretty pictures and so that's the thing that got debunked but lots of people went on um, being fascinated by the differences and so there is a colossal amount of research uh, since the so-called debunking era 
Yeah. Um, and it needed somebody to immerse themselves in it and try and see the overall pattern and the shape and the meaning of it. And, and if you want me to say much about that, but I'll leave you De to leave. Definitely, yeah. yeah. What, what is the shape and the pattern? Okay. <laughs> so, yeah. well, I guess, what, I guess what why... I... I was going to say, I guess, why are they so clearly divided? I mean, if you look at a picture of a brain or if you think of a picture of a brain, there, there is a clear gap in yes. the middle. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. I assume I heard that has almost, a purpose. <laughs> I, I, although I heard almost nothing about the right hemisphere um, in medical school, um, it apparently was there just to prop up the left hemisphere, which did everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, there was an interesting question, which is, why is this brain, which is just a nexus of neurons and depends on the number of connections it can make to have the power that it has, why would you build one of those with a whopping great divide down the middle so that only 2% of neurons in the brain actually cross? Um, right. Second thing, why are the two hemispheres asymmetrical in the same way? And why... Third thing, why is the band of fibers at the base of the brain called the corpus callosum, which connects the two, why is a lot of its work inhibitory? It's not saying, you need to know about this. I mean, it does that, of course. But a lot of what it does, probably the majority is, you keep out of this, I'm dealing with it. And the history of that, my, my theory, my belief, my hypothesis, which I, 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 I don't know a better one, and I've never heard anybody suggest a better one, is that all creatures evolved in this way, and it's not just us that you know, have these divided brains, um, this goes all the way down through animals and so on, right down to the most primitive nerve centers in, in worms and, and, and insects, um, and the most ancient neural network in the world, seven million years old in a sea anemone, uh, is already asymmetrical. It's very interesting. And I think the, the reason behind this is that every creature has to solve a problem that doesn't sound difficult now, but is generally and has been throughout history very difficult, which is how to eat and stay alive. Because the problem is, in order to eat, you've got to grab stuff, you've got to identify it and get it you've got to catch that rabbit whatever it is you've got to be focused on something and get it and that requires a hyper focused very clear cut kind of attention to a detail but if you're only paying that attention you become somebody else's lunch while you're getting your own because you're not looking out for everything else that predator you're not looking out for your mate for your for your offspring that you need to feed and so on so one part of the brain has evolved to do this grabbing and getting, and it's not very bright. I mean, the left hemisphere, contrary right. to what one was taught, is not particularly intelligent. The, the, the right hemisphere is actually more responsible for the element we measure in IQ as well as emotional and social intelligence. I mean, the ideas got out there that, yes, OK, the right hemisphere might be good at emotional and social intelligence, but, you know, real intelligence, IQ. No, <laughs> and the right hemisphere is more important for that as well, because it is the one that basically is able to understand, to see things, to make connections, to see patterns. And it's through the making of connections and those patterns that we come to understand the world, including scientists and mathematicians. They all describe so clearly. They don't reach their results by plodding along a track in a linear way. They work on something, they get nowhere, they turn their attention away, and bingo, they're going shopping, and suddenly the thing comes to them. You know? so, and that comes from the right hemisphere. I mean, we know that very definitely. It's, it's related to the right superior temporal sulcus and the right amygdala. I, I, um, I remember hearing a story, and I don't know whether this is related, but it was a story about um, a, a beetle in Australia that uh, the, they, they were dying out, and the reason why was because they, they kept on trying to um, have sex with um, broken beer bottles um, that were discarded and outside. And the reason they were scientists were saying was because they couldn't figure out that the beer bottle was not another shiny beetle. So they were basically sort of thinking they had done their job and then heading off. And I'd imagine that would be very much the left brain thinking that, okay, this is a mate, but actually it's a bottle, it's very different things, so and nothing was happening. And I, I almost wonder, I mean, if, if, I guess if you go a level deeper, it could, could be maybe this is sci-fi talk, but I mean, the, the, the world that we see, as far as I can tell, is 
is a construct of our of our brain like our brain tells us that there is color and it tells us that this is green and this mm. is what green looks like and probably even deeper than that and so i wonder whether you know there's there's, there's obviously a whole raft of things in around us that surround mm. us that we can't see like we can't see radio waves if you wanted to take a basic mm. example <laughs> unless we have a yeah. scanner um and i'm yeah. sure there are other things that we don't even have machines that can measure but are there and maybe those are things that we have feelings of for course. i don't know uh, and we can't it's, it's hear sounds that, that bats and bears can hear for example we, we right. can't hear them at all right so we might think they weren't yes. there but they are so you're absolutely so I wonder, right yeah this this sort of if i remember rightly so it's the left left brain is very focused and very very rigid and it's yes. it's it's, it's it's that's it's well yeah is it is, is it a, yes. is there a creative or a non-creative part i mean or are they both kind of creative um, I mean, well that makes it, any it's sense em it's embarrassing um to have to say this um i would love it not to be true but after researching it in great depth i can say that unfortunately this piece of pop law happens to be correct. The right hemisphere is much more important <laughs> in contributing to creativity. Um, right. But yes, I mean, the thing that's so interesting to me is that people had focused on the machine question, assuming the brain was a machine. So what does it do? The question you ask about a machine, what's it designed for? But in fact, it's not about the what, it's about the how. And I find that this distinction between the how and the what is very important across a whole range of problems in the world that the how we neglect but it's actually the how that makes all the difference um, and so you're right that in a sense what we see you said I think make it up uh, what I want to do and I know you're talking shorthand but nonetheless there are <laughs> important philosophical points here and the world tends to divide into people who have a rather naive view that the world just is out there and it's our job to record it, as it were, passively, um, like, like a photographic plate or, 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 a, or a mechanical re voice recorder. But in fact, um, it's not that. And it's not the other um, uh, extreme position, which is a kind of postmodern position, that effectively there is no reality because we just make it all up in our heads. Neither of these simplistic positions is correct. And it's all about what I call the betweenness, the betweenness of my mind and whatever is outside of it in the world. And so what I say is experience is an encounter. And it's the quality of the encounter brings something of me to it, of course. And that, that yeah. goes with the idea that each person sees things slightly differently, although the differences can be exaggerated. On the whole, when we meet people, we can have a co common conversation about what we find in yeah. the world. <laughs> but, but, thankfully. But, but, <laughs> thankfully. Um, so, you know, we, we, do, we do have that. Um, but it also, there's something out there that we really do make contact with. I'm very, very keen to make that point that, you know, it's not a waste of time our perceiving. We're not duped by it. Um, but you see, the difference between the hemispheres, one of the many, is that the left hemisphere starts with a, its own purpose to get, grab and get, and it only sees little bits of things. So it, it has a design in its mind in a very abstract way. But the right hemisphere sees the complexity of the world, the fact that things are interconnected, not atomistic, as they seem to the left hemisphere, that they're always moving, flowing and changing, not rigid and separate like slices, as they are in the left hemisphere, that they're animate, that they contain implicit meaning, not as the right, left hemisphere only understands explicit meaning and so forth. So the left hemisphere can't understand jokes, takes them seriously, can't understand poems. So what does this mean? And um, whereas the right hemisphere is picking up all of this richness, and the difference in the end is that you've got one very big, broad, rich, dynamic, animate picture of the world, that of the right hemisphere. And you've got a schema, a map, a theory about how the world should be according to what's going on in the left hemisphere. And, and that's a very important contrast in the modern world. I, I, you know, I argue in both these books that we are moving further and further into a left hemisphere dominated world, but it's now become extraordinary how much people believe their theory about what things should be like over the manifest testimony of experience. It's, it's, I wonder whether part of that, the, the sort of 
left bias is is could that partly be because we spend a lot of time in front of computers and screens which kind of train us to you know there's there'll literally be a thing which says click here do this do that i know we're from a marketing my background's in marketing and advertising whenever we were doing stuff online our advice would always be you know, to tell the brand to have a clear call to action because people are much more likely to do as you say when they're looking at things on the computer screen so i wonder whether the sort of brain is kind of almost I merging that, with a machine in some sort of way well i think it is but i think one can only blame what you're describing uh, too much time spent on the the two-dimensional screen um, that's an element, but I think the roots of this go back much further, go back probably a couple of hundred years. And in The Master and His Emissary, the first part is um, neurology and neuropsychology and philosophy, but the second part is an attempt to look at the turning points in the history of the West. And effectively, one can see three arcs. In Greece, in Rome, and in our present civilization since the Renaissance. And each of these seems to start with the right hemisphere and left hemisphere working maximally fruitfully together. The left hemisphere always being under the aegis or the control or the oversight, or whatever one wants to put it, of the right hemisphere. Because the right hemisphere in the title of that book is the master. The left hemisphere is just right. an emissary who goes about and does stuff for the master. But it doesn't realize. Because it knows less, it thinks it knows more. You see, the less people know, the more they think they know everything. It's only when you know a hell of a lot you realise you don't know very much. So yeah. um, the, left, the left hemisphere um, thinks it knows everything and thinks it knows better than the right hemisphere. But I, I can tell you in every way it's inferior. So except in this one important way of helping us manipulate the world through language, it's not the only one that deals with language, the right hemisphere does as well, but the left hemisphere deals with the ways in which we can target things with language, make them very precise. And it deals with the, the right hand, which is, after all, the bit which, for most of us, is how we manipulate. So I think what happens is that civilizations overreach themselves. They become too big physically, geographically. They become too um, steep in their power hierarchy and their need for goods and so on. And this demands a, a very machine-like, bureaucratic way of thinking, which is rolled out in a phrase that I abominate <laughs> across the, the empire. Um, yeah. and, uh, and this is part of it. Uh, the left hemisphere makes you stupid but rich and most people right. are so addicted to being rich that they don't mind being made stupid in the process and now what's happening is that we spend um, so much of our time interacting with machines even if as I have done today as I seem to do almost every day spent too long on a telephone with somebody in a call center where you are effectively <laughs> talking to a human being who has been reduced against his or her yeah. will to behaving like a machine. And so right. and we're, now t we're now taught by people who don't understand what, what they're looking at when they're looking at a human being, that human beings are just faulty versions of what could be done much better by a machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, really it bad. would take us rather a long time to unpack the full crassness yeah. <laughs> of that position. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is uh, in my I, books. I, I, Anybody who's well, listening who wants to find out more, they're in my, it's all in my books. It's, yeah. Uh, and the books are fantastic and available anywhere. So, uh, <laughs> and even if you, even if you're not a big reader, um, your latest book is great for weight training as well. Uh, so if you want to, uh, just, uh, uh, it's another use. Um, it's, uh, it's very marvelous. But then you, you, I guess, um, it was interesting what you said. I love the way that you, you I, I remember Rory Southern telling me about that, that, um, you know, when they've done experiments and, and you look at someone who knows a topic really, really well, and you ask them how sure they are about an answer to something, they'll say, well, I'm not hundred percent sure. But if, if you ask someone who just knows a little bit about the subject, they're like, yes, I'm a hundred percent sure. This is definitely right. Yeah, and I, exactly. I, I mean, I wonder if that, if that related at all to sort of, I guess Rory would often say that most of what we do is unconscious we don't realize that we're doing it oh, so if we had to focus on breathing if we had to focus on just yes. you know walking life would be pretty exhausting um yes so it's yes. it's it, and it, do you know what is there a rough percentage of that is there like a, yes there is um 
and it's about half a percent is what we're conscious of, right. of, of, wow. of what's being processed by our brains. And uh, there's nothing inferior about the unconscious. Indeed, if we could survive allowing the unconscious to deal with almost everything, it, we'd be doing a very good job. And in fact, part <laughs> of making people wise is enabling them to get comfortable with things that are embodied skills that they don't have to consciously think about because they will do them much better. If you talk to a, a skilled chess player or a skilled pilot or surgeon um, and ask them, how did he do that? They will make up something, oh, I just thought, you know, I don't know how it happened. You know? but, but basically, <laughs> the unconscious mind is able to take into account 17, 20 streams of information and balance them in a way that we could, if we were, had them all on a list explicitly, we wouldn't know what to do with them. And once you make something explicit in, in, a, in language, you have reduced it to one thing out of all, all the great collapse of all that knowledge, all that wisdom, all that hard learnt experience is reduced to a few sentences that you can then argue about. And a great philosopher, A.N. Whitehead, you know, he was a logician, mathematician and philosopher and wrote with Bertrand Russell, the um, Principia Mathematica. He is a philosopher I greatly admire. And he says that consciousness is something that civilizations thrive as they make less and less necessary for consciousness. Because consciousness is rich and conscious, sorry, unconsciousness is rich. Consciousness is very expensive. And he says it's like cavalry charges in battle. You should only do it very occasionally. It's very costly and you need fresh horses. So what happens is when we, we find we're stuck, there's a problem, something's gone wrong. That's when the conscious mind comes and says, let's see if I can unknit this. Um, and it's quite good at that. Well, very good at that. But it, it, when it's done its job, you want it to push off because now you want the, the business to go on again under its own steam. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I, I um, the, the, there were so many different places I wanted to go there. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to look at my notes to try and uh, uh, re, re, uh, rebalance myself. Um, because I fear if I go, if I go down the route of questioning, I was going to that, uh, that this might take longer than an hour. <laughs> but uh, I, I can, I can do my best. I am doing my best to give shortish answers to, oh, to no, very you're deep being questions. Absolutely yeah. incredible. This is incredible. <laughs> I, the, the next sort of, um, I don't know whether it's related or not, but it's probably almost going back a little bit. But one of the things I was going to ask is, you're one of the few people I know who is you know and, and please correct me if I'm wrong but you, you you've been a psychologist and a sort of neuroscientist so like when you're looking at the brain it, it, did, are there when, when you're looking at particularly left and right brain are there any areas that the two in that the two professions agree on <laughs> um or are they do, <laughs> well, they, actually, do they have I, very different I'm views a, I'm actually a psychiatrist uh, rather oh, than a psychologist. I mean, a lot of people don't really know what the difference is, but a psychiatrist is, is a medically trained doctor. A psychologist um, usually isn't. Um, but uh, you can't be a psychiatrist, obviously, without knowing your psychology. Yeah. Um, right. <laughs> I, I hope. <laughs> um, yeah. Are there things where, where they agree? Well, of course, there, there, there are. You're talking about what neuroscience and and the sort of business of treating patients do they come together is that what you're, we were yeah. asking or? Uh, so, sort of i i the reason why I, the, where where it came from was i remember when i was working at, at ogilvy i hired a child neuroscientist um to come into the agency and talk about how the brain works and um i just thought it would be interesting to you know kind of like we were talking about before like this you know my belief is that in today's world it pays to know a little about a lot um, I think yes. uh, uh, they sometimes call it sort of T-shaped people. You know, maybe there's one thing yes. that you like, and you have a broad understanding mm. of things. And so I thought if if a if a if a neuroscientist could come in and tell us about how the brain roughly works, you know, what what makes mm. us mm. is there any way to tell it to tell what makes us happy or what makes us sad or is there a way to train the brain? All these kind of things. So that that was what I what I got them in mm. to talk about. Mm. But I'd imagine that 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 what they think is maybe different to the more sort of um, 
psychological side of things if that makes sense sorry for not using my words correctly <laughs> no no um i mean of course the number of questions um the, the the question raises when you ask how does the brain works i mean you, um that would take 40 years to answer um <laughs> quite quite right but but to come to the narrower question there is more of a divide than i would like there to be between people right. who effectively um are and there are people who are fairly narrow scientists. They they do all their work in a laboratory. They work on um, using machines to to investigate very small points, very fine issues. Um, the world needs such people. But generally speaking, anyone who is dealing with real human beings um, sees something else, um, which is a different kind of picture, which is much more like the right hemisphere's picture, the broad one the rich embodied one, the animate one, whereas the the technical one tends towards the the detail that is inanimate and not connected with anything else. So there is <laughs> there is that effective dichotomy, but I think where I see the, the most exciting things coming is from people who um, can do both, like V. S. Ramachandran, for example. Right. Um, yeah. And, and and I what I've found gratifying is that people like him and Jörg Panksepp and um, Howard Gardner and other people who work in in an overlap between the the clinical and the neuroscience have been the people who have who jumped first to my side, if you like. Um, and I find that the most uphill battle is with people who have looked at one tiny thing for a very long time. Right. I can't see why I need to connect this with people's <laughs> lives. I mean, why would you do that? I mean, <laughs> actually, on the on yeah. the the film, the divided brain, which um, quite 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 good in places. Um, there's a conversation with Mike Gazaniga, who's a, who's a very distinguished and you're a psychologist, and I don't. Um, other than respect him, but he did say a very interesting thing, which I thought was rather revealing. He said, well, McGilchrist takes these sets of findings, as it were, in neuroscience, and then applies them to the lives of real people. I'm not comfortable with that. <laughs> I, I thought, well, th th that, that's rather an extraordinary thing to say. Um, but it's all, all in keeping with the way things have gone. Um, in fact, when I got to the Maudsley, because... You know, I'd had this fellowship at All Souls, which was a very rarefied academic thing, and I've always been uh, a very academic uh, creature. And when I got to the Maudsley Hospital, which is, I mean, it likes to think it is, and I, I, I wouldn't demur, um, the, 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 the most distinguished training centre for psychiatrists in, in the country, uh, it was attached to the Institute of Psychiatry, and I went there because I wanted to do some research. And somebody said, oh, yes, please come and talk to me about what research you'd like to do. And I said to this um, lovely person and uh, distinguished person, um, uh, I want to investigate how ch children develop the concept of time, which I still consider an absolutely fantastic question. <laughs> um, yeah. And she looked... She looked at me and her eyes sort of glazed over and she said, um, come and clone the P450 receptor. <laughs> I said, I don't want to clone the P450 receptor. But this is what <laughs> happens, is that people build yeah. empires on expensive machines that do detailed things. And they then really not got no room for somebody who is interested in the philosophical implications of all this. So I realised that what I had to do was to do it myself, basically, you know, to go off, make my own life, um, pay for it by seeing patients, which I fortunately absolutely love and find fascinating, <laughs> and then uh, use the, 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 my, be in charge of my own time so that I could spend a lot of time researching, reading, and, and so on. When you're um, helping people, do you find... There's a, my understanding of, of the brain is that it's elastic and that like if you don't exercise it much like a muscle, there are parts of it that can sort of atrophy um, or, or, or at least shrink. Um, when you're working with patients, if you wanted to, if you, I don't know, I don't know whether this is ever, would ever be a real thing, but if you, if you met someone who was sort of almost sort of too stuck in the logic, would, would you ever give them exercises to try and work out the, their creative brain a little bit so sort of almost doing exercises that for your brain if that makes sense yes yes um 
Well, well first well, of all, vice versa. <laughs> yeah, no, no, quite. Um, first of all, it's a, it's an interesting observation that uh, domesticated animals have smaller brains than their wild counterparts, and we have smaller yeah. brains than the Neanderthals had. Um, so it, that bears a little bit of reflection. But yes, I think um, tendencies are are reinforced. N not so much that there are material changes in the brain. I mean, there are, but that's not really the highly significant thing. It's that we neglect whole areas uh, that are open to our intellect and our imagination, and and we don't see them. I mean, people I, I find this a difficult one to focus on, but I say it's a bit like a radio set. Um, it, it may be that um, after you get a new radio and you're excited, you listen to a couple of favourite channels, and after a while you only tune into one channel. The radio set is still capable of bringing in any channel you want. It's just that you're asking it only to do one channel. Now, that is really the situation in a way that we find ourselves in. And to come to your question of what can we give them exercises, I think the answer is no, not in that sense, but yes, in another way. Um, and this is best explained by my saying, if I give you six things to do every day before breakfast that you know, will change your life, they won't really, <laughs> because you'll still be thinking of everything, including these exercises, in our normal reductionist, utilitarian way. Well, this is something good for me. It'll make me make more money. Hey, very good. So, but that's what, actually what we're talking about. What we're talking about is a whole different way of thinking. And Einstein said this brilliant thing. We can't get out of the hole we're in with the same thinking that got us into it in the first place. So what one has to do is to change the whole way we think. And if you do that, the rest will follow. Now, there are practical things I can say, like mindfulness is very helpful. It is. I think it helps nourish the way of thinking of the right hemisphere, which is not jumping in and chattering about things all the time, but being sustainedly attentive, vigilant and aware, listening to the world and what it's saying, as it were, being actively receptive, not in a passive way, like a sound recorder, but actually meeting the world being very present, very alert, very conscious, but not filling the space with your talk. That is important. I think all children should be taught that. And I think there are things to say about the way um, education has become technical instruction these days, even in what used to be called the humanities. Uh, the ingestion of the regurgitation of information seems to have taken over from using your mind and being trained how to use your brain. But anyway, um, it, it, the, the, the thing I'd like to say here is a lot of people have written to me saying things like this. I realise after reading your book, uh, and it's usually... Um, uh, they're meaning the master and his emissary because this has been going on now for 10 years. People have been writing to me. And they say, I, I, I guess, I see it my, myself. I'm slightly autistic. I, 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 you know, I'm somewhere on that spectrum. I'm rather left hemisphere dominant. Uh, but you have helped me see that and helped me see what it is I'm missing and have helped me begin to change. And so they say rather moving things like, my marriage has improved. My job is going better. I'm happier. I, I, you know, and, and so this is very rewarding because, of course, one of the things that part of my reason for wanting to study medicine was academic and intellectual about the philosophical questions I described, how the mind and body relate. But part of it was to be helpful. My father was a doctor. His father was a doctor. They weren't great thinkers or anything, but they were in part of that. I, I grew up with this rather wonderful idea of being somebody who could help people. And um, yeah. I, I felt that very strongly when I was in clinical practice because uh, people kept saying it. Like, well, what, what would it feel like when you're not practicing? So, because the last 11, 12 years, I've not been in clinical practice. I'm living on an island you know, in, in Scotland, um, thinking, writing, talking. But I realised that actually I was helping people, just in a mm -hmm. different way. This almost reminds me a bit of sort of Douglas Adams, where it's kind of the question is more important than the answers often. Mm. Um, yeah, maybe mm. the kind of mm. un understanding where they were and being able to 
question themselves and their actions help to give them answers that oh anyway yes uh, yes simon <laughs> simon 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 vey who's a, a um uh, to a lot of people, a quite well-known um, 20th century French thinker, um, said, love the question. And what she meant was, don't treat it in a superficial way or something. Bond with this question and allow it time to be addressed. Don't just think, well, I don't know what to make of that. So I think that that is part of yeah. what you were saying. You hang on to the question. Yeah. And often not having an answer is yeah. fine. I'm quite worried by some yeah. people because they think they've got an answer. Yeah, uh, it's, it's lovely. Uh, I, I wish more learning was like that. Uh, we're, we're working <laughs> on it. Um, <laughs> um, I know in part two of your book, um, you mentioned that there were sort of four main paths um, I think you described them as you, you described them as science, yes. reason, intuition, and imagination. And yes. I guess for these, the kind of it, I was trying to understand more about it. Are these the the mm. three? Are these the four things that that sort of are these four sort of parts of the brain that you can work on, or or, or that everyone has a different mix of? Or yeah, sorry. I could. You see, <laughs> I think you could. You could see it like that. I suppose. But in fact, um, one of my general beliefs is that parts don't exist. They're an invention of our way of looking at things. Things are whole. And after right. our left hemisphere has got hold of them and started analysing, it produces parts. But let's be clear, they're an artefact of the m mode of attention. So when you say, are they in parts of the brain, they're not even pa wholly dis with a T. Oh, pass, pass with a TH, yes. <laughs> well, they, they yeah. are the, they're, I, what I consider to be the most likely candidates that most people would come up with. I mean, they, almost everybody, if you ask them, yeah. so how do we actually get to know anything about the world? I mean, very few people would not mention science or reason. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and because um, intuitions had rather a bad rap lately, um, it's not appreciated, although, frankly, it's outstandingly important. And when we lose it, we become the kind of clever idiots that I think we now are. Um, and imagination is also not, um, uh, you know, uh, a way of taking one away from reality and having a bit of a relax. <laughs> uh, imagination is a very serious matter, which is actually the only way in which one feels one's way into what it is one's looking at. So imagination is a very deep thing, and without it you can't... No imagination, no maths, no imagination, no scientific discoveries. Not only no Tintoretto, no whatever, no, no, no Bach, but actually nothing of this works. And people who have very little imagination are very, very difficult to be around or to attempt to live with. Can one train them? Well, I suppose, yes, of course you can. I mean, and we, we tend to be trained in science more than anything, I suppose, these days. Um, most people get at least the basics of science. But what they see is something very boring, which is entirely procedural, um, rather redundant, in which one's endlessly proving the blindingly obvious. And, uh, you know, when I, when I did this at school, I thought, oh, God, I wanted to be a scientist. I don't want to be one now. But if instead they talked to me about, um, you know, black holes and, and dark energy and things like that, I, I just thought... Ah, now here's something that's really interesting and important. Anyway, so we do need all of these faculties, and we're not we're actively discouraged from using our intuitions and our imagination, because everything has to be monitored, everything has to be micromanaged. We we live in the worst possible world in which the the mindset of micromanagement, which is toxic in business, is now applied to everything, to academe, to medicine, to whatever. We need to lay off and allow things to come to life again and allow people to use their experience and their intuition as well as, of course, their reason and their science. One never lets go of those. Yeah. It's uh, in, <clears throat> possibly related to something else that, that, uh, that I wondered about is, do, do you know what happens in the brain when we sleep? Because I, I associate sleep a lot with the imagination side of things, which is what came, came yes. to mind when you were talking just then. Yes. But do, do you have any idea of what's going on there? Well, it, it depends what you mean by having an idea. I mean, we can do um, EEG traces. We've been doing that for 
youngs, and and you can see differences in 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 the brain, obviously, that are indicative of sleep. Brain activity changes, right? Um, and the frontal lobes, which are the most recently evolved part of the brain, and whose job is basically to be an inhibitor of the posterior cortex of the brain uh, and and the inferior cortex as well. In other words, the bits of the brain that lie further towards the back of your head and underneath. Um, that is relatively less uh, active. The visual cortex becomes extremely active. Um, and there is um, no clear evidence about left and right in dreaming, but the balance is definitely that the important parts of dreaming are from the right hemisphere, which one would imagine would be the case for all sorts of reasons. It understands symbolic meaning, for example, and it's it's uh, right. no surprise that um, that you know the mythologies that were picked up by Jung um, used symbols that he also used and are as it were there for the using and the asking in our brains, but our chatty modern. Uh, know it all mind has uh, said, Oh, we, we don't need that anymore. We don't, we, 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 that's all kind of rubbish. So, <laughs> but yes, I mean, problems can be solved famously in dreams, and there are well known instances of this by great scientists. But whatever, it does seem to be a very important thing. And uh, as so often, I think it's one of those things that one needs to turn on its head. I, I thought a long time ago that the question was not why do we spend so much of our lives asleep? But why do we spend so much of our lives awake? And um, if we could, we'd, we'd remain sleeping. Rather, as I said, if we didn't have to be conscious for certain rather technical demands, um, uh, like getting and grabbing, um, we, we'd be better <laughs> off remaining largely unconscious, which wouldn't mean we wouldn't have any kind of mental life. The, the unconscious is an extremely rich kind of mental life. Anyway, so yes, there we go. Yes, it's, it's almost like um, I, I, I feel uh, with, with our conversation that there's, there's definitely a, a, a love of the right hand side of the brain, I mean, which, which fits with me. So I think we're, we're often left brain, uh, we live in a left brain sort of world. I think, and so it's, uh, I'm, yes, I'm always yes, a big proponent. So. That's true. And one thing I ought to say, because I misunderstood often, um, I don't think it would be better if we all had a left hemisphere stroke. There is nothing wrong with the left yeah. hemisphere. It's a it's a very useful yeah. servant. Anything is wrong. It's that it thinks it's the master. That's the point. It should always be this hierarchy of one that knows more and protects and uses what's helpful from the other. But things go out of balance when the one that knows less believes it is the one that knows more. And that's not just a neuroscience truth. It's an ancient um, insight, which you can find in Japanese literature, in Chinese literature, in Indian literature, in the North American native peoples uh, mythology, the this same story is known to them. And that's really the story it's, it's that I not... meant to, to indicate by the title, The Master and His Emissary. Anyway, yeah. No, I mean, I was, I was going to say, if you're talking about all people I know that is it, it um, in Buddhism that they have sort of uh, views of that as well, is that, is that right? Or, <laughs> yeah. They have views of what, um, sorry? The, the, the sort of, they have that, that kind of view of a, of a left and right divided world and maybe divided brain, if that makes sense, um, or, or is that Would, not? Well, yes, I mean, one of the problems, one of the reasons that people assume that because I have something to say about the current imbalance. Um, that I, we live in a very black and white world with all the shades of subtlety have been um, lost, and and so um, if you if you're not this extreme, you must be that extreme. You see this everywhere. Right. I mean, of course, it's the, yeah. it's the devil of social media. You know, you, the, the idea that actually you can have a balanced opinion in which. Well, under certain circumstances, that's true, but under others, it's not. And we need a bit of this, and we need a bit of that, and so on. So the right hemisphere understands this. It, it also is the hemisphere of both and. After all, it's the one that 
the, the, asked the emissary to do its job, it deputed yeah. the emissary. Yeah. So it knows it needs both. Whereas the, the, the left hemisphere doesn't know. It's, it's either or. And I, I sometimes yeah, say uh, uh, that we, we need not either either or, or both hand, but we need both either or and both hand. We need both these ways of thinking in different circumstances. Marvellous. Um, Look, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll probably uh, uh, try, and, try and wrap up. And I wanted to ask you a, a silly question to end with. Um, it, it's a would you rather. <laughs> Um, so, <laughs> so I had uh, people always I mean, I, say a silly question when it's going to be a very difficult one to answer. <laughs> That's what I, they mean. I, 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 what I'll do is I'll give you two, and then you choose which one you want to ask and answer it. And then I'll, cut, <laughs> I'll cut out the one that you didn't want to ask. All right. So, okay, yeah. um, uh, I've, I've got first one was like, would you rather have a fast forward or a rewind button in your life? That was one option. And the second one I was going to give is, would you rather be able to talk with animals or speak all foreign languages? Uh, oh, it's interesting questions. Um, I think the first, sorry, I shouldn't say that, should I? I think the question about the fast forward button or the, or the rewind button, I suppose it depends whether you had any, you were granted in this improbable set of circumstances, you were granted the ability to 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 to, to change something. So if it, if it were possible, then I would love to rewind. I would love to be able to talk to my younger self and say, "You worried too much about this. You should have thought about that," and so on. Um, fast forward. Uh, I'm not a great fan of either my future as I approach the grave, uh, <laughs> or of <laughs> or, or of, of of the future in general. I'm afraid in the direction it's going now. Although I I have I see there are signs of hope that people will people are so fed up with this what I have shown them to be this left hemisphere world. I think a lot of people, you know, they they're hungry to hear something far more interesting, imaginative, sophisticated. And the, the beautiful thing is, is it's backed up by a heck of a lot of science. 5,600 papers are referred to and detailed wow. in my latest book. Um, yes, would I like to, I think I, would I like to, to learn all the languages of the world or would I like to speak with animals? I would like to speak with animals. One of the things that's happened in the writing of these books is I've had to research a great deal more about animal cognition. And we now, now know so much more about animals and all kinds of things that, you know, 40 years ago, we thought, oh, animals can't do this, they can't do that, they don't have this, that we have, we're so wonderful. And they can... time and again, we've learned that actually animals know a heck of a lot more than we think. And they know plenty of things that we don't know, just as we know plenty of things that they don't know. And I would very much like to be able to enter into, as far as one can, the, the minds of some animals and to be able to converse with them, to exchange whatever it is is in my mind with theirs. And the, and the, the one that I would imagine would be the benefit of would be myself. I, I do like languages. Um, I find they're fun and interesting, and they give you new terms. I, you know, the great thing is that languages have words for differences that we don't, or we have differences that other languages don't. That's great. And, and Goethe said, uh, effectively, as many languages as you speak, so many lives have you lived. So it's a very rich thing. I, 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 it's a choice between two wonderful things, but probably the animal thing is the one that I would find most, most fascinating. Yeah, absolutely brilliant answers for both. <laughs> okay, I'll keep both. <laughs> it's, we'll keep you didn't both. Pick one. It's fantastic. Yeah, I am. Um, I I remember reading. I wonder whether this is related to some of the stuff you were saying earlier. I remember reading that. Um, uh, is it dolphins when they sleep, they sort of shut down one side yes. of their brain or something, so they can they're always it, awake. Is that is that the same it, with a lot it, of animals? Uh, um, it's, it's certainly true of some aquatic animals as well as dolphins, but it's not true, generally speaking, of of most land-dwelling animals. No. Right. Um, and if, but if they're doing that 
does that mean that mm. do they still have left and right brains dolphins then or y yes they do uh, and uh, their right hemisphere is uh, as it is with us more more social more uh, connected to other creatures and the left hemisphere is more targeted towards pred predation to 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 catch right. things um yeah so but i mean the things that we don't understand about animals uh, is extraordinary i learned just today that um in the history of of whales and whaling um there was one species of whale that is known to be very dangerous it was the gray whale and they were known to attack large ships and sort of uh, and, and so people knew that trying to catch a grey whale was, was quite a battle. And they could be extremely aggressive towards humans, which generally speaking, whales are not. But uh, at some point, there was an international treaty that said we must not um, pursue uh, grey whales. They're absolutely not to be touched. And within 48 hours, of this happening, grey whales started approaching human beings in the water and being very affectionate in the way that whales generally are. And make what you like of it. I, I haven't had a chance to research uh -huh. the origins of this story. But we don't, I mean, all I will say is that we, we shouldn't rush to conclusions. We don't know um, a thousand well, we don't of know. it, really. <laughs> no, exactly. exactly. Yeah. We don't know what it is we don't know, and that's a very important... You know, that, that remark about the unknown unknowns, which people laughed at, was a very astute remark. <laughs> Might have been the only no, astute I, I remark he ever made, but... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I, I'm, I'm very happy that I don't know a lot of things. Uh, I mean, it means, uh, means there's, there's lots exactly. more space for me to, to grow yes, and expand. Exactly. I, exactly. I, I've, it's been such an honour chatting with you and, and thank you so, so much for taking your time. And um, if anyone's listening, you have to go and buy all of Ian's books. Um, it's mandatory. <laughs> um, and so, and, and uh, if, you, if you want to um, hear more incredible talks, um, Ian's also got a fantastic YouTube channel as well. Uh, if you just uh, yes. go into Google and type in Ian McIlcrest, you'll, you'll find it. Um, yes. Is there uh, anywhere else people uh, can reach out no, to you? No. Or, uh... Well, it's Channel McGilchrist, that's the place. Um, which is the, the which is what you're referring to, but I, I have um, in, infested or infected YouTube rather widely. One of my friends <laughs> said to me in a sort of slightly cross way, "I can't go online anywhere now without bumping into you." <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, it's the, the left brain algorithm. Uh, <laughs> just uh, yes, pointing yes. them all in your direction, pointing them to, to. That's it. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> Very <laughs> good. Ian, thank you so much again. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Chris. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. <laughs>